Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine from Tor. I've got some really bright lights up here. We're still filing in in the back, but I think I'm going to get started because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So, hi, I'm Roger from Tor. Uh, and let me get the clicker working. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to start off telling people a little bit about uh, how Tor works. How many people know quite a bit about how Tor works already? Raise your hand if. Great, I see a lot of hands. Awesome. So I'm going to blow through the beginning introduction stuff and then we're going to talk more about the censorship side of things. So, what is Tor? Uh, Tor is a free software project. Tor is a nonprofit. Tor is a protocol. Tor is a network of volunteers running relays around the world. Tor is a bunch of researchers trying to figure out how to provide better privacy and better uh, anonymity and better safety to people around the world. And we've got some number of users. It's a bit hard to tell because it's an anonymity or privacy system. But one estimate puts us at about 2 million users a day. And another more recent estimate puts us at about 8 million users a day, which is a huge network of people. At this point, the average Tor user is the average internet user, which is pretty cool. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? The easy, so the, the, the threat model, the, the question is we've got this user Alice. She's trying to go to some website Bob or some service Bob and somebody is trying to learn who is going to which place. So maybe somebody's watching Alice's local network connection. Maybe that's somebody spying on the Starbucks. Maybe that's somebody being Comcast or the local telco. Or maybe they're watching on the Bob side. Maybe they're watching WikiLeaks and they want to know who's connecting to it. Or maybe they're somewhere in between their NSA or AT&T or something like that. So that, this is the, the scenario that we're trying to think about. An important thing to consider, anonymity is not encryption. You should use encryption. Encryption is good. But even when you're using encryption, somebody watching your traffic gets to learn who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking to them. And I keep talking to companies who say, no, I use a VPN. It's totally fine. I've got, I've got encryption. I'm good. Uh, whenever the intelligence agencies are thinking about figuring out who's talking to who, they draw their social network graph, they figure out who's in the middle, they figure out whose house to break into. So it's not even about breaking the encryption anymore. It's about drawing the social graph and figuring out who's interesting. So another way of looking at that, everybody here knows creepy NSA dude, I hope. Uh, so we kill people based on metadata is his quote from a few years ago. So that metadata is exactly the name of the game on the Tor side. We try to protect uh, who's talking to who, what websites you're going to, where you are in the world when you're using the internet, things like that. So I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to uh, other researchers. When I'm talking to my parents, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system because privacy is a good American value. But when I'm talking to companies, I tell them I'm working on communication security or network security because I hear privacy is dead, I hear anonymity is scary, but, but you're right, communication security, that's a really important thing to do. And when I'm talking to governments, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And again, it's the same system, it's the same security properties, it's the same users, but they're using it for different reasons. And part of the goal of this is to try to figure out how to frame this for different people so that they can all blend together. You can't have a cancer survivor's anonymity system where all the users are cancer survivors because then everybody will know why you're installing it and why you're a user. So you need this wide variety of people. And then the fourth category we're going to talk about today is the reachability side of things. Uh, people trying to uh, access websites like like BBC and GitHub from different parts around the world. So the goal of Tor is to blend all of these different groups into the same network so that they can provide security for each other. So how does it work in a nutshell? You've got a, a, we've got a, a network of relays around the world and people build circuits, build paths through three of the relays and the goal is that no single relay gets to learn which user is talking to which destination. So that was actually only half of it. The, the, that was the network level privacy half. There's also the browser level privacy half where uh, cookies and flash and uh, browser resolution and all sorts of other things uh, can give you away or can make you identifiable while you're browsing the web. So the second half of Tor is Tor Browser which is a version of Firefox that tries to fix all of these application level issues. And there are other ways of using Tor. There's an operating system called Tails which is Debian based which has everything you want pre-configured and nothing you shouldn't want. And it's a live CD so when you're done you pull it back out and everything disappears from your system. We now have a Tor browser Android which is awesome. So there's, now that Firefox actually works well on Android, we can have a Tor browser on Android so there's an actual uh, first class Tor browser that does everything that, that the normal Tor browser does on Android which is great. 
So another piece of, of knowing about the Tor background is how fast the network's gotten over time. And we've got, uh, so the, the capacity, the, the, the actual load on the network is up to like 200 gigabits a second and the capacity of the network is something like twice that. So we're uh, on the level of Wikipedia or something like that. So there's a, there's a lot of different traffic going through the network from our millions of users. Okay, so one of the questions that we think about in terms of uh, how to assess, you know, whether Tor is doing its job is the, how do you measure safety? How do you measure diversity? How do you figure out uh, whether, whether Tor is, is keeping somebody safe and, and how do we think about that? So the first question is the diversity of where the relays are. The more different relays we have around the world, the safer it can be, the less likely it is that a, that a given attacker is going to be able to watch all the traffic going into the network and also your traffic going out of it. So for example, French intelligence probably isn't in a good position to be able to see enough of the traffic on the internet to start correlating people. So where the relays are is, a, is a, an important first piece. The second piece is diversity of types of users. This goes back to the privacy, anonymity, traffic analysis resistance side where it's not just about how many people we have, it's about what kind of people. So for example, the average Tor user in Iran is not a political dissident trying to take down their government. The average Tor user in Iran is a Facebook user trying to reach Facebook. And that's critical for safety and security of the rest of them because that means you can't, I mean if Iran wanted to round up all of their 20 year olds and kill them, I guess they could do that, but it wouldn't actually work. It wouldn't actually uh, get rid of the political dissidents. It would create more. We all know how that works. So that the normalness of using Tor is a key piece of its security. And then a last thing to think about, uh, transparency is a really important piece of how we build Tor. So we've got, it's open source. Uh, we give you specifications. We describe everything and, and try to uh, work with the research community to understand what security properties we get. And we identify ourselves and go on stage, hi, I'm Roger, I'm from Tor. And the key thing to remember here, uh, a lot of people look at this and they're like, oh, ha, ha, the privacy people are talking about transparency, ha, ha, that's so stupid. No, privacy is about choice. Privacy is about control. And we choose to be transparent because it helps us build a better community, a better tool, a better software, a better protocol, a better network of relay volunteers around the world. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? Uh, we've got, uh, I guess, three different pieces. The first one is uh, the background of the censorship side of things. The second one is what's happened in the past couple of years in terms of new attacks from uh, governments that are trying to censor Tor. And then the third one is uh, a bunch of new tools that we're working on that will hopefully move us forward in the arms race. Okay, so I'm going to start with the background side of things. How many people here know about Tor bridges and uh, pluggable transports and phrases like that? I see far fewer hands than before. Okay, awesome. So when you're trying to think about a censorship resistance tool, there are really two pieces to it. The first piece is the relaying component, the encryption, how you build the paths, stuff like that. And the second piece is the discovery component. Where do you learn the addresses or the proxies or, uh, or whatever first contact you have? Where do you, how do you learn how to connect into the network in a way that, that you can get an address that somebody else hasn't blocked already? So the simple version from the Tor side of the discovery approach is we have a centralized set of directory authorities and they build a list of all the relays and then all the clients fetch that list. And that's great, it's simple, it's easy to understand, we can think about the security of it, but it's not good from a censorship side because you, the adversary, get the list of, of all the public relays and you block them and that's the end of it. So that's actually not how the story started. Uh, the first blocking that we had was actually blocking of Tor's website back in 2006. And then in 2007, Smart Filter and WebSense started blocking the Tor HTTP directory fetches because we were using unencrypted HTTP back then. So yeah, so that, it, it started off not from a more complicated thing. It started off from the blocking the website and blocking uh, the initial Tor protocol. And blocking the website actually works really well. Like, here are some screenshots from back then of the Tor website from various countries around the world. And we've got, you know, some fun ones. It's, uh, uh, here we are, uh, this website found, uh, 
cannot be accessed in the UAE. Uh, here's another one. The site has been blocked due to content that is contrary to the laws of the Sultanate. And they're, you know, they're trying to make it fun. We've got another one uh, down here. Um, oops, uh, you know, oops, we, we blocked this thing. Oops, we're fascists. Uh, sorry, this is, you know, this is fun. Uh, and. And there's this recurring theme where people are trying to make it fun. They're not, I mean, we're not, you know, totalitarian regimes. We're just trying to help you out on the internet. They're, they're these friendly, goofy people who are, uh, who are the reason why this website doesn't load. It's all fun. Why, why are you all so angry? So blocking the Tor website actually worked pretty well back then because at the time everybody thought that anonymizers or proxy tools were websites that you go to. So people would try going to the Tor website, it wouldn't work, and they would say, oh, I guess Tor doesn't work anymore. And Tor worked if you had a copy of it, and there were people in Iran who were giving it out over USB keys or something like that. Uh, but blocking the website actually worked pretty well. So fast forward a few years, the next interesting event was, uh, so does everybody remember, uh, I guess 10 years ago, there was an election in Iran and uh, this guy named Mousavi won, but then suddenly he wasn't in charge and then there were a lot of people who were angry in the streets. Uh, at that point, the government did a lot of uh, trying to censor things and trying to, to block things. One of the, the key steps that they took was throttling SSL. So they bought this fancy new Nokia Siemens device and got somebody from Russia to come in and, and configure it for them. And they detected SSL on the wire and then turned down the bandwidth that you get for SSL. And because Tor was trying to look like SSL, because who would block SSL, they ended up throttling Tor uh, at the same time without even uh, taking any extra steps to do that. So that's actually one of the ways. Let, let's think about this more thoroughly. There are four basic ways of blocking Tor. The first one, those directory authorities I talked about before, they're centralized. There are nine of them. If you block them, nobody can bootstrap. The second one is you get the list of the 7,000 relays around the world and you block all of those by IP address. The third one is you look at Tor's network fingerprint and you do deep packet inspection to try to figure out if this flow that you're seeing is related to Tor. Uh, and then the fourth one is you block the website or prevent people from getting the software. So one of the fixes we had at the time uh, for this sort of thing was what we call Tor bridges. And the idea is let's get all of the users who are in uh, less blocked areas to offer to be secret relays, private relays for censored users. So the idea is rather than here are 7,000 IP addresses and I want to keep China from learning them, instead here are thousands of bridge addresses and there is no public complete list of them and now we want to give out bridge addresses one at a time to the good guys so the bad guys can't learn all of them. And that turns out to be a crappy arms race, but that was, that was the first step that we were thinking. And how do you get a bridge at the time? Uh, and this is still basically the same answer. You go to bridges.torproject.org, solve a CAPTCHA, and it looks at what slash 16 of the internet you're coming from and gives you a different answer based on where you are and what day it is. And the goal of that is every user is going to get a few bridges, but if you want to learn all of them, then you need to come from a lot of different places of the internet and be consistent and persistent about it. Another approach is you can email us from your Gmail account and we'll answer the same Gmail account the same way, so you need to build a lot of Gmail accounts in order to learn all of the bridges that are given out through that strategy. Another answer is uh, I knew a great guy in Shanghai and I sent him some bridges and he sent them to his people and, uh, and that was the social network approach. Uh, or you can also just run your own private bridge and just tell your friends about it and we don't even have to know about it. So there's actually a much better interface inside Tor Browser for this at this point. So I don't know how many people can see uh, the tiny font from back there, but uh, basically there's a, an interface for you to say, uh, my government blocks Tor and I need to use a bridge and it says either paste the bridge address you know here or there's this other cool approach which we added recently that uses domain fronting. I'll talk about what that is later. But basically it routes the traffic through uh, Azure Cloud into bridges.torproject.org so that that you can automatically get a bridge from inside Tor Browser without having to learn how, uh, how the bridge database works or even how, you know, what you're supposed to do. You just go inside Tor Browser and you click on it and you solve the CAPTCHA and it magically gives you a couple of bridges. So that was cool back then. And 
The first interesting uh, attack from China happened right about the time, it was like the 60th anniversary of some dude becoming in charge in China, and they grabbed all the public relays and blocked them, and they grabbed the HTTPS version of the bridge distribution mechanism. So they blocked a bunch of bridges, but it turns out they didn't block the other distribution mechanisms. So we'd, I mean, it's easy to block Tor from a public perspective, so we knew this was coming, so we designed the bridge thing, we'd rolled it out, we'd translated a bunch of stuff into Chinese, and the result was, so here's a graph of the number of people using one of the Tor relays at the time, and it sort of plummeted right about uh, the 60th anniversary. But at the same time, tens of thousands of people switched over to using bridges from inside China. So this is a, a pretty awesome example of preparing for the arms race and rolling out something and then having it go the way that you expect it to go. So that, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is a little while later China got the, the, the second one, the Gmail one, and at that point we were down to social, di social network distribution or run your own private one, and that's, that's still kind of where we are. I'll talk more uh, later on in the talk about uh, some of the better approaches, but one of the big research questions that still exists in the world is how do we come up with really good bridge distribution mechanisms? Let's say you've got thousands of private bridges and you've got a bunch of users around the world who want to get some and you've got adversaries who are well-funded and they want to learn all of them. How do you give out these bridges in a way that the good guys are going to get some and the bad guys aren't going to get all of them? Okay, so the next interesting attack was uh, Iran a few months after that they did not at all do what we were expecting. You'd think that they would get the list of public relays and block them. No, they used their fancy new Nokia Siemens device to DPI for SSL and look for the particular Diffie-Hellman parameter prime that we were using. So this was the very first step that Iran used to block Tor. They DPI'd for our SSL handshake and they looked for a particular number in the handshake and said, you're using a different prime than Firefox and Apache use, so we're going we're gonna to cut those connections. So we started off making a list of like 15 ways somebody can block Tor and what we would do for each one of them. Boy, was this not on our list of 15 ways people could block Tor. So the feature of this, the, the good feature, was uh, since the Diffie-Hellman parameter is a server-side parameter, it's in the, like, the TLS certificate that the, server si uh, that the server supplies, we could change just the relay side, just the bridge side, and users didn't have to update at all. So it was just we change a couple of relays and suddenly things work again. So here's a graph of people who were using Tor from Iran at the time. You can see when the blocking happens. And it was actually a great guy from Team Cymru who was messing around in the Tor code. And he's like, I don't know what this constant is, but when I change this constant, it starts working again. So that was wonderful for him to, to find that and be able to fix it in a week or two. So fast forward a little bit more to Egypt. Uh, there was a bunch of interesting stuff happening around the Arab Spring. You can see in the graph where they block Facebook, and you can see in the graph where they unplug the internet. And my favorite part of this is there are a lot more people afterwards using Tor than before, because there are a lot of people saying, yeah, yeah, we had a coup, yeah, we, you know, revolution, okay, but the military is still watching everything they were watching before, the surveillance infrastructure is still in place, you're darn right, I'm going to be trying to use some, some safety security tools. Okay, so fast forward a little bit more. Uh, then they ended up, Iran ended up blocking Tor using DPI, looking at a different TLS parameter. So that was, you can see the little red dot on the right hand side. So there was a much shorter event because I happened to be at home at the time looking at things. Somebody found it. We figured out what it was. We rolled out a patch like 12 hours later, and it basically didn't interrupt them uh, much at all and maybe that caused them to not do uh, that further arms race, but that's a crappy arms race in general where we try to look like SSL and they try to fi figure out a way where we don't really look like Firefox talking to Apache. So we'll come up with, uh, with some better approaches, but in the meantime, how many people here know the horrible story of blue code in Syria? I see one hand. Every time I ask, there's one hand, no matter the size of the audience. Oh, oh, okay, three hands, great. So a larger audience has three people who know what it is. So, this is a, a story that everybody should know about. Long ago, in 2011 or something like that, there were some folks from Anonymous, from Telecomics, uh, who found a misconfigured FTP server in Syria with gigabytes of blue coat logs on it. And each line in the log was, this IP address tried to access this website and I allowed it or I disallowed it. 
So it's just line after line of line after, of IP address and URL and whether it worked. And that's actually kind of fucked up in general that they, you know, that they have this surveillance and censorship infrastructure and that they uh, screwed up and put their logs out. But another piece of that is Syria is actually on the list of places that uh, American companies aren't supposed to sell their stuff to. So these folks are like, hey, what you doing running the surveillance censorship infra infrastructure in Syria? And Bluecoat's like, oh no, that's not us. And they're like, but the top of the log line says Bluecoat version 1.5 point something. And they're like, oh well, yeah, okay, we, we sold it to Dubai. And how are we supposed to know that, that Dubai resold it to Syria? And so then they're like, yeah, and we, we totally shut off the auto update and there's no way that, that, the, that these things are going to continue getting uh, their updates. So the folks from Telecomics got the serial number from the Bluecoat device and connected to the update server and they were offered an update. So basically Bluecoat lied every step of the way and the, the end of the story is, and then the State Department gave Bluecoat an award for their cooperation in the investigation. So it's kind of a sad story. It actually, it continues. Bluecoat was sold to Symantec. So now Symantec runs the surveillance and censorship infrastructure uh, and they probably don't even know it. So this is a recurring theme of these little arms dealers in Sunnyvale, California who build these tools and then their salespeople go out and they try to sell it to Burma and Syria and, uh, and, and all the other countries that they can. And it's even worse than that. So I was in a meeting a few years ago with the German foreign ministry and they were trying to figure out what should Europe do in terms of laws about like should we allow Italian companies like a hacking team to, to deploy their stuff in Saudi Arabia? What are, the, what are the constraints that we as Europe should have? And one of the meeting, one of the discussions I had was with a telco engineer from UAE who's like, look, you folks mandated the back doors and all the routers. You put all the lawful intercept stuff in and now you're angry when my prince plugs a port into the lawful intercept port on the router that, that you made. You put the back doors in there and now you're upset when we use them. So there's a, a, there's a big discussion right now about, how, uh, about encryption and back doors and so on. And one of the really uh, fucked up things is that nobody arguing about encryption from the FBI side realizes there are other countries in the world. So once you build a tool and you put your back door in it and then other people use it and they don't have the same judicial process that we have, even if ours were good, uh, then, then you end up with a bunch of different problems all around the world. So part of the, the challenge here is how do we build tools that are safe no matter which government is using them and that don't enable governments to start hurting people even more. Okay, so speaking of that, I had a really interesting meeting with the fellow in charge of the Tunisia uh, internet right after their revolution. So before revolution, he was like a mid-level engineer and suddenly he was in charge of the whole thing afterwards, which was awesome. And he was the first one, he gave a speech while I was there in French, because that was the language he was comfortable with, saying, yes, we use smart filter and yes, we pay them a million dollars a year and imagine how much food we could buy for our country if we weren't spending a million dollars a year on this stupid censorship stuff. So that was awesome as the very first country to admit to be censoring. And another interesting part of that, they don't actually operate smart filter themselves. They outsource the smart filter operation to some foreign company. He wouldn't tell me which one, but I assume they're in France or something. So there's some French company that gets to see and decide what the Tunisian military can do on the internet. That's not just a privacy thing, that's not just a censorship thing, that's a, that's a national security thing, that's a national sovereignty thing where you outsource what your internet looks like to some foreign company. And that happens over and over around the world. And then the last interesting part of the Tunisia story, apparently they only pay a million dollars because then SmartFilter went to Saudi Arabia and said, it works in Tunisia, you pay full price. So there's a, a, a lot of interesting uh, discussion to be had about those companies. Okay, so moving on from the, the, that particular Arab Spring world, the arms race with TLS is a crappy one. We can't just keep on pretending to look like SSL because they're going to go back and forth finding a little thing, we fix a little thing. The real answer is what we call pluggable transports. The real answer is you leave the privacy anonymity side for Tor and then separately you have modules that you can pop in that transform the Tor traffic into something that people are, uh, are less likely to be willing to block. People, something that, that people expect or that they can't afford to block or something like that. And there are two 
successful pluggable transports right now that are deployed in the world. The first one is called Obs proxy, obfuscating proxy. And the basic idea is you add another layer of encryption on top and the goal is that somebody doing DPI to figure out what protocol you're talking, the answer is I don't recognize this. And then they have, they're forced to choose, do I block everything that I can't classify? In which case there's going to be a, a huge false positive uh, pr side, or do I allow things that I can't classify and then Ops Proxy goes in. And then the other piece of it is called uh, Meek or Domain Fronting, and the idea is that you route your traffic to Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud or Azure or something like that, and uh, from there you reach through the Tor network using their cloud services, and that way they're forced to either block Google or not block Google. Okay, so that was the background side of things, and I'm going to speed up a little bit to cover some more things. Okay, so the next step, uh, China again did a thing we were not expecting. It's called active probing. So we were thinking, you know, they'll block some more bridges, they'll DPI for other stuff. No, they looked at all the connections that looked like they might have been Tor, they're like SSL of some sort, and then they make a follow-up Tor connection of their own to that destination and talk the Tor protocol to it. And if the other side says, yes, I'm a Tor bridge, uh, by talking the Tor protocol, then they cut that connection and blacklist that IP address. So they can't, they, they basically have infrastructure running uh, at the nation level, in, at the you know, backbone level in, in China, uh, being able to make all these outgoing connections uh, within a second or so of when they see something. And so the fix is another iteration of Ops Proxy where the client needs to prove knowledge of some secret, some password. So when you give out the bridge line, it comes with a bunch more parameters, including a secret. And if the client connecting to the Ops Proxy doesn't know the secret, then the job of the Ops Proxy bridge is to act naturally natural, whatever that means. And act natural is kind of a complicated, like what do I do? What do I do so that there's no fingerprint? And the best answer we have right now is we wait for a random number of seconds and then we hang up. Because if we ever provided an error, that would be a fingerprint. So we need to come up with something that, that blends in with a lot of background traffic in a way that, uh, that isn't going to be recognizable later. Okay, so there are a bunch of other interesting stories that I, I'm happy to tell you about later. Uh, Ethiopia for a while, DPI'd uh, ag again on the SSL handshake and then they stopped. Uh, Russia has an interesting story. So here's a graph of people connecting uh, into the Tor network from Russia during a couple of years ago. And the fun part of this graph is people inside Facebook apparently have the exact inverse of this graph of Russia people connecting to Facebook. So this was when Russia blocked Facebook twice, uh, three times, and then uh, a bunch of people in Russia decided to use the Tor network in order to reach Facebook safely. And then Turkey's been doing some weird stuff that we still don't fully understand. There's definitely DPI involved. I don't think there's IP address blocking. They do it and then they stop and then they start and then they do something else. Uh, so they've been, they've been experimenting with a lot of things recently. And then Venezuela is another fun example. They have an ISP called CAN TV, which is sort of their like Comcast equivalent, and it blocked the public tour relays and uh, a small set of public tour bridges, but it didn't do any DPI, so it was just blocking by IP address. Okay. Um, so another uh, challenge that we've got uh, in China right now, there are a couple of other circumvention tool projects, there's one called Lantern, that actually reuses the OBS proxy design. And the idea, it's supposed to be modular, it doesn't have to be just Tor, it could be anything. Um, so they, they give out these bridges to their people and after a while the bridges stop working as well. Are they being throttled? Is somebody learning about them? How are they learning about them? So there's a bunch of mysteries and design questions to solve there. But the important lesson is this feedback loop is really bad. So you, you do a thing, and it's not really clear whether they blocked a thing or not, so you don't know whether you need to change. So the, the tighter feedback loop we can have and the more certainty we can have about what's going on, the better everything works. And recently, so it used to be that China looked for a particular TLS pattern, uh, something in the certificate, something in the cipher suites that the clients are offering, and if both of those matched, then it triggered the active probing. We've changed the cipher suites to try to look like the more recent Firefox and the more recent Apache, and uh, some combination of patterns doesn't trigger the active probing right now. So are they not following up as closely as they could? There's a lot to be researched in there. And then another piece, let's not forget the, like, the political side of things. 
So a couple of years ago, apparently, there were these folks from the CIA who had their own anonymity system, and uh, Iran learned about it and then watched who was using it and then killed everybody, and also they told China about it, so then China did the same thing to the, the spies there. So there's one of the lessons there is don't have your own anonymity system because then everybody who uses it is going to be you, and uh, if they find some users and they start learning how it works. So you need a lot of different groups to blend in with. But the, the more important lesson from the, the censorship side of things, Australia censors their internet. England has this thing called the Internet Watch Foundation, which is part of their government, which censors the internet. Denmark censors the internet. Sweden censors the internet. So when governments go to China and say, hey, you're being a bad government by, by preventing people from reaching BBC, China quite reasonably says, look, we're just keeping our citizens safe just like everybody else. We're, why are you picking on us? We're, we're protecting our users from the internet. And so one lesson there is maybe we should work on cleaning up what we consider, you know, Western countries and the fact that they're excited to be censoring their internet. Uh, and if we can't solve the fact that Australia wants to censor, how on earth are we going to solve the fact that Saudi Arabia wants to censor? And speaking of the political side, these are the actual honest to God cyber police in China. These are the official cyber police in China. And this goes back to the, you know, making it fun side of things. We're not, we're not a regime out to stop things. We're just, you know, keeping the internet safe because this is fun. Uh, and if you see one of these people on some of the websites you go to, then it helps remind you about what websites you should go to and what websites you shouldn't go to. So it's, it's not just about censorship. It's about creating an awareness among the users that they're being watched and then they can control themselves. And I should also mention, so there's a, 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 a province of China called East Turkestan. They actually call it New Province in Chinese. And right now, the people in China are uh, basically wiping out the folks who live there. It's at the point where uh, the, the, the folks who live there have a live-in Han Chinese person who lives in their house and watches them and reports on them. And they take their kids away and they put them in re-education camps. And you get to see your kid for one hour a week on the other side of the chain link fence. But your kid spends the whole hour yelling at you about how you're a bad Chinese person. So they are genociding the people who live there. And I was talking to some folks there and I'm like, so here's PGP and here's Tor. And they're like, yeah, I can't go a block without showing papers that I don't have. They take away my devices and they install things on them. They're living in my house. So here's a, a, an important example where a tool for internet privacy is not going to solve some of the really bad things that are happening around the world. Okay, so what are some of the newer things that we're, uh, that we're deploying in terms of, uh, of tools that can be helpful for later? One of the really interesting ones is called Snowflake. The idea, so in the past for Ops Proxy, you, you find a nice person who knows what Linux is and they apt-get install obs4 proxy, apt-get install tor, they edit a text file, maybe they open a port, uh, and if you knew all those words, you're in good shape, but most people in the world don't do that. So the cooler way to do that, 10 minutes, awesome, the cooler way to do that is a tool called Snowflake, which is JavaScript that runs in your browser. So I'm a helpful person in a non-censored area. I want to help out the Tor world. So I install the Snowflake extension or I go to a website which gives me some JavaScript and suddenly I'm a Tor bridge without installing any new software. It's all running inside my browser and it uses WebRTC so it does NAT piercing correctly. And the goal there is to have uh, a blizzard of Snowflakes all around the world where blocking them by IP address isn't going to make sense because you're going to end up blocking every browser on the internet. And blocking them by DPI doesn't make sense because WebRTC is what Google Hangouts uses. It's what a bunch of video chat things use. So if we can actually uh, use the real WebRTC that normal uh, browsers use when they're talking to each other and doing video chat, uh, and if we can get an army of millions of snowflakes, then, uh, then hopefully this will be a cool new move forward in the arms race. So you can install the Firefox extension, Snowflake, right now, and it will turn you into one of these volunteers. So it used to be a few years ago that we didn't need the extension side. There's just a website, you serve some JavaScript, and 
I mean, you could put it on your Facebook page, you could put it in an ad if you were evil, which we're not. Uh, so basically, all sorts of different ways of giving people the JavaScript, except the browser world is moving to not running things in the background. If there's a tab and it's not the primary tab that's open, then it doesn't run the JavaScript there. So we need to shift to a world where you install an extension and then you're opting in, it's all above board, and you're volunteering to be one of these relays. So please install the Snowflake extension and we're working on coming up with a better GUI and better uh, visualization and feedback about how many snowflakes there are in the world. And if you're a Chrome person rather than a Firefox person, there's another one called Cupcake that's been around for longer and now has Snowflake built in as well. And it's got these cool uh, 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 icons that tell you how your cupcake is doing, are you helping, or is it sad, is it happy, stuff like that. So we'd love some help on the development side of Snowflake and Cupcake. At the same time, we need more OBS4 bridges. So here's a URL, community.torproject.org slash relay slash setup slash bridge. And please go there, follow the instructions. If you're a Debian person, it's all pretty easy. Uh, the most complicated thing is opening a, a port on your firewall. Or maybe you have a computer on the real internet and you don't even have to do that step. So uh, it'd be wonderful to have some more OBS4 bridges so that we can uh, have more flexibility about giving out more addresses in more ways without getting them blocked as quickly. And in the future, we're experimenting with uh, an app to install Tor servers that like gives you a decision tree sort of thing where it says, do you want to be a bridge? And you say yes. And it says, do you want to open this? And you say yes. And then you don't have to know what a text file is in order to be helping out and running an OBS4 bridge. Okay, so I'm going to skip a couple more. Uh, I'll briefly talk about some of these things and then we'll get to the end. So one of the important pieces, we need some sort of feedback cycle for how, so we're trying to give out bridges and we want to give them out in a way that works. What does works mean? One of the answers is uh, imagine you have a bunch of different bridge distribution channels and each channel, it's maybe you give it out over Gmail, maybe you give it to a nice guy in Shanghai. There are a bunch of different uh, possible approaches to a distribution channel. And let's see. Great. Uh, so let's think about for each channel how much use do the bridges get that we give out over that channel? Do they end up being used a lot before it gets blocked? Does it never get blocked? Does it get blocked quickly? Does it never get used much but also it never gets blocked? And then let's figure out how quickly the blocking actually happens and then let's reward the channels that end up giving out bridges well. So if there are a bunch of channels that get bridges blocked quickly, they don't get more bridges. If there are a bunch of channels that work really well and they end up having uh, a lot of users and they're working well, uh, then we shift more bridges to being allocated through that. So in theory, there could be like a dynamic feedback process where we automatically learn which distribution channels are working well and automatically give the bridges out to those. It turns out that measuring bridge reachability is really hard. Uh, do we install a computer in China and scan all the bridges and hope that China never notices that we're doing that? Do we give out a few addresses to each volunteer and let them scan them and hope that the volunteers aren't the bad guys trying to learn them? So there is a, a project called UNI, the Open Observatory for Network Interference, that is uh, basically a, a mobile app that lets you test a bunch of things from your local network. Its main goal is to figure out uh, how am I being censored, but maybe we can also use this as an infrastructure for learning about uh, which bridges are blocked where and, and what how reachability works. So there are a couple of other interesting upcoming things. Uh, there's a tool called Format Transforming Encryption or Marionette. And the idea is that it transforms the traffic into whatever regular expression you describe. So if you can describe HTTP as a regexp, then it will transform Tor traffic into what looks like legitimate unencrypted HTTP traffic on the wire. And if you've got a DPI engine that has a classifier for HTTP and it says, yes, this is HTTP, then the classifier thinks it should let it through. I let normal unencrypted web browsing through. Uh, another approach that people are working on is called decoy routing and the idea is that uh, the user does an SSL connection somewhere and something in the middle of the network running at like an ISP and uh, Verizon or something looks at a steganographic tag inside the SSL handshake and says, ah, this is decoy routing traffic. I'm going to reroute it internally to the Tor network or to some circumvention tool in a way that the local uh, ISP for the user thinks that they're talking to the decoy destination, but actually the traffic is being routed, redirected to somewhere else. 
Okay, so arms races, the censorship arms race sucks because China has billions of dollars and there are a lot of uh, companies like Cisco and Bluecode and so on who are building tools like this. The surveillance arms race is worse. At least in the censorship case, you try a thing, it doesn't work, you change it, it works. Great, we, the cycle is pretty si simple. From the surveillance side, you try a thing, you don't know if they saw you, so you don't know if you need to change it, and then there's no feedback loop. So maybe we need a new Ed Snowden coming out every week with a new set of documents. Uh, I don't know how to end up with that feedback loop in a way that you can tell whether the surveillance uh, is working. Okay, so how can you help on this side of things? So run an OBS4 bridge, we mentioned that. Be a snowflake, we mentioned that. Please teach your friends all about Tor. There are a lot of uh, mainstream journalism places that want to scare people about the internet with pictures of icebergs and, uh, and discussions of you know 99 other internets out there and dark webs and so on. So please help us teach the world what Tor actually is, how Tor actually works, why privacy is important on the internet. And there's a, a research community, petsymposium.org, that writes a bunch of interesting research papers. If you want to do grad school on Tor or you're in grad school and you want to work on Tor, love to chat with you more. And speaking of the donation side, we're running a bug smash fund this August, all of the month of August. And the goal is a lot of our normal funders only want to fund some shiny new feature. And we actually want to go through and fix all the bugs and make things stable and actually uh, make it reliable and work the way that everybody expected it to. And funders don't really want to fund that sort of thing. So we'd love to have your help getting the word out about, uh, about the bug smash fund. And then, uh, we have an awesome new onion badge that a great volunteer made. We also have a booth for the first time ever in the vendor area. So if you want to see the onion badges, I believe that uh, $40, I think is what they said, for getting one of these cool, and I'll turn on the, the blinky lights as it's going. Happy to show you this more later. And then, Again, we mentioned the booth. For the first time ever, we're in the vendor area. I hear there's a mob right there right now, and I'm gonna answer a few questions in the back with my bright green shirt, and then I'm gonna lead the mob over to the vendor area, and I'm gonna be hanging out there for the rest of the day in my bright green shirt answering your tour questions. Thank you.